let's see if we can get this working. Okay, so I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'd like to echo Lars' uh, acknowledgement uh, for, for a very good uh, organization so far, especially to uh, to to Shannon and to to Jarl for for uh, making this uh, conference happen. Um, so. I will give a slightly more uh, talk on a slightly more technical level, but don't worry, it will not go into technical details. Um, so the topic is on uh, automating model building on high performance C infrastructures. Um, today, we have access to high throughput technologies to study biological phenomena. We, we do have uh, massively parallel sequencing, high throughput uh, screening and uh, high throughput proteomics and metabolomics and so on. And uh, uh, this uh, sort of poses new challenges for us, uh, especially in the data management and analysis uh, field. Uh, we need to store, analyze uh, this data. We need to, to be able to automate things that we could do previously manually. Uh, we need to worry about uh, data security, how to integrate these resources, and uh, in many cases uh, we also want to make uh, predictions. So my research focus is how we can enable uh, high throughput biology and starting from e-infrastructures and up. And with e-infrastructures to get this out of the way, uh, I, uh, this is sort of the, uh, the networks, the computers, and the tools associated with them that enable us to, to carry out our research. Uh, many people think of e-infrastructures as high performance computing, but I will also show that uh, there's, there's more to it than that. Uh, so uh, I'm involved in uh, massively parallel sequencing projects and, and, and uh, metabolomics projects, uh, but here I will mostly talk about predictive modeling in toxicology and pharmacology. Uh, so, so I place a, place a particular focus on large-scale predictive modeling, so, so interested in, 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 uh, in larger problems or, or many problems, um, how we can evaluate the, the predictive performance, uh, connecting a lot to what Lars previously presented, uh, the sharing uh, and consumption of models, when, once we've built the model, how can we share it, how can we use it, and how can we try to automate the rebuilding of it so that we don't only create a snapshot that once and then we use that for the next five years which is very commonly the place. So starting off we, we make some observations that um, predictive toxicology and pharmacology are becoming data intensive with, with these high throughput technologies. Um, but we also make the observation uh, that data is continuously updated and it nicely connects to, to, the, to the picture that Lars showed previously at AstraZeneca. And I mean, this is the case uh, that we, we do make predictions and we do improve uh, our, our understanding at the time uh, and we need to sort of capture that in our analysis. Um, I also do uh, uh, QSAR modeling. We, are, we, we use different methods, but QSAR modeling is, is one method that, that, that uh, is, is, of course, widely known in, uh, in this audience. Uh, it's a picture of Lars here, slightly younger version. Uh, we use a lot the signatures uh, uh, description of molecule uh, that, that uh, Lars previously explained so well. We found it works generally well. And, and I cannot like that because uh, 10 years ago, if someone would ask me, I would say, yeah, you know, it depends on the problem and, you know, it's, it's a bit of touch and feel and uh, more of an art. I never really liked that. So I'm, I'm very happy that we, we now, that we, uh, until someone shows me something that works better, I will sort of stick with the signatures for, as, a, as, a, as a generally good descriptor of, of the chemical structures. We, well, support vector machine is, is what we, we usually, we found it works well together with the uh, uh, molecular signatures. Uh, so, but, but we're not really sort of locked into that uh, as well. But it's it been shown to do, be a robust modeling tool. Um, we can inter we, I, I really like that we can interpret the results from, from signatures and treat them as, as as uh, signatures, uh, as substructures, and, and visualize them. And Lars also covered this very, very nicely before, so I don't need to go into detail uh, about uh, how this is how this is done. 
So uh, when it comes to delivery of models, um, uh, we have um, for, for the last 10 years, or, uh, almost more, I think 2005, uh, in our group developed the Bioclips uh, software where we can uh, publish and produce models to predict uh, and then the predict results based on chemical structure and visualize the results. And it lends itself very nicely to these types of, of problems. You can then for example, add, update and edit the chemical structure and you, will, you can re, re predict and get visual feedback on, okay, what if I did this uh, uh, modif structural modification, how would that affect my predictions? And this, is, uh, this has been appreciated by, by um, medicinal chemists. Primarily. We have various types of visualization. You, you can work, of course, with, with collections of molecules and, and generate reports and all, all, all sorts of things. Um, okay, so getting closer to, to the talk, uh, to the title of this talk. Um, so, what if we want to model a large number of observations on, on and we, we want to do this on, on high performance computing? Because, uh, sort of, uh, we have a research question when, at what sizes, is it really useful to move from your laptop or your workstation to, for example, a, a supercomputer center? Um, how, and how can we sort of work uh, efficiently, ef effectively on this, uh, in this, with these tools? Do, do we need nonlinear methods? They take more time and so on. So we were interested in, in doing this as, as QSO datasets get larger. And uh, when we talk about high performance computing, uh, this is usually when, when you talk about a, a supercomputer center or a high performance computing center, um, you, uh, you think of compute clusters. You have compute nodes, they have a certain amount of compute cores on each. And if they are connected uh, through a, a fast interconnect that you can have uh, like MPI programs, you exchange a lot of uh, messages between them, you usually refer to that as high performance computing. Uh, whereas a lot of the biology today is high throughput computing. We, we, we split our problems into uh, individual pieces and we, we analyze them in parallel. And we don't really need a fast interconnect. In, in principle, we don't need really a supercomputer. We need a compute cluster. And it doesn't really matter if one part of the compute cluster stands in one building and the other one in, in another building or another city and so on. So it's more towards distributed computing in that sense. So I'm, I'm not saying that all problems are like that, but a lot of the problems. If you talk, for example, about uh, sequencing, which I, I'm, I'm involved in this. Uh, in very few cases we, we, we move out of node, we stay within one compute node for, for, for a task. But of course, high throughput computing um, is sort of the, the term that's not as widely known and I will refer, actually refer to high performance computing, high throughput computing with, uh, with just saying HPC, high performance computing. Because you can do high throughput computing on a high performance computer as well, you just don't use the fast network that you have between. And this is the, the, in principle the, the, the easy thing to do. But if you can afford a fast network, sure, go ahead and buy it. Um, so. Uh, Cloud computing is of course something uh, very different and I'm not going to go into details and talk about these tools but, but saying that in this talk I w when I say cloud computing I'm meaning infrastructure as a service and that more or less means that I, you may, uh, most of you have heard about Amazon and Google Cloud that, that I, will, uh, I can go to Amazon and I say I would like to have 10 nodes with this Linux uh, uh, operating system I want them to have five gigabytes of memory and they should have five virtual CPUs each. Submit. They will charge my credit card and I will get them the resources in, in, in well, ranging from seconds to uh, maybe a minute or two or something. And I don't, need to, uh, I don't need to stand in a queue for a supercomputing center and so on. And then I get these uh, computers and I'm root. I own them. I can do whatever I want with them. And when I don't need them anymore, I will shut them down. So this is one part of cloud computing that's referred to as infrastructure as a service. You get, more or less, you buy a computer and you get it here, but instead of buying it, you rent the compute time virtually from someone and you don't really know where that is, the computer is, and you don't care. That's abstracted away from you. And it's very convenient for some, uh, for some purposes, and, but there also comes with, with other challenges, for, for example, with data privacy and so on are, are important challenges in this. 
So I happen to be the co-director of our uh, high performance computing center in, in Uppsala, Sweden, responsible for, for the national uh, bioinformatics uh, uh, supercomputers, which is kind of convenient in one way. Um, and it opens up a lot of uh, avenues to, to collaborate with people who have expertise in this and much more expertise than we traditionally have in bioinformatics. So you get access to, to high memory machines, to multiple nodes, to private clouds. Um, there are some, if, if you look at some of the drawbacks of uh, high performance computing, it's usually you have an, a terminal usage. You, you log in uh, via uh, SSH, a terminal, it's text based, you don't have fancy command lines because the supercomputer centers are notoriously afraid of being hacked. So they, many, uh, including ours, there's no internet connection. You, you have to go, uh, or there's no web connection, I should say, in that sense. You have a queuing system, and you have to live with that. And this is just to show the, the enormous explosion in the number of projects. This is only in, in, in Sweden. Uh, when you compare uh, this red, these are the biology users, and these are, are the tradition, uh, all other users, including physics, astronomy, and so on. So it's really booming the use of high performance computing in, in uh, and this, we should say that a lot of this is because uh, the, the new next generation sequencing data needs a lot more resources than previously. But if you look at bioinformatics in general, and we, we have analyzed a bit, so the, how efficient are they? So Upmax in this case is, uh, we, we, say, we can say physics because they are the largest users. They, they are down here, on, on the x-axis here you have the, the percent of the CPU used, and on the y-axis you have the percentage of the ROM used when you reserve a node. And you see you want to be either here where you use all the CPUs or up here you use all the memory or you know or, or on, on this uh, axis here or this, on this line but you don't want to be down here where you use both the CPU and the ROM very inefficiently so this this simply tells us that in bioinformatics we, we have a long way left to use computers that uh, what they do in physics but we also do have a very different problems. We tackle different problems. We use the computers in ways that they don't. And, and actually, the, the supercomputer centers are usually built to serve physics. And, and uh, but this is this is changing now. And when you automate things, it's really when you come more from go from production down to the researchers the level of automation decreases. You don't automate basic science the way that you can automate a, a sequencing core facility lab when you have the data coming out and you can go down and so on. Okay, getting back to, 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 we had a hypothesis that we can use workflow system to, to enable agile, large-scale predictive modeling. This is what we want to do. And there are a lot of challenges, of course. To, to, and the data integration is a, real, a big part that is, uh, uh, challenging to us and, and I, I think it's uh, extremely important all the work being done in standardizing this so that we can have easy access to integrated data simplify that it's also and uh, when you go to large-scale modeling it's a challenge to actually automate, automate this so this is just to show uh, how what a workflow tool is most of you have seen it it, it allows you to decompose your different an your analysis into smaller subcomponents, tie them together and run them in a system that supports this, preferably on a supercomputer which will uh, parallelize this and run it efficiently for you uh, on the number of nodes and you will have your results faster. So we surveyed the, the, the field what we wanted, we wanted, I'm not going to go into detail, but what we decided to be agile we say that a domain specific language where you actually construct the new language that would not be sufficient for us. We wanted a forward dependency definition where you sort of take go from the start. Oh, whoops. I have too many things to hold. I have too many things to hold here and I try to, you know. Where you define, you know, I want to do this stage and after that I want to do that stage and after that I want to do that stage. Whereas the backward dependency definition, you say, I want this results, and in order to calculate that, I need to go through that, then I need to go through that, you work your way backwards. This was not what we wanted. So, um, Samuel Lampa worked a lot on extending a, a system called uh, Luigi, developed by Spotify for statistical analysis. We call this Sci Luigi, and we, this is uh, something that we use to, to uh, keep together our modeling on our supercomputers. And uh, Jonathan Alvarsson, uh, a postdoc in our lab, uh, is using this system to look at 
uh, rather as large data as we can get and in this case we're reaching up to one, about 1 million uh, compounds and we, we, we use the predicted ACD log D from, from Campbell and get 1.2 million structure, uh, structures for that. Rather large QSAR data set, yes. Um, and we see if you use a, a, a linear kernel or an, an uh, regular base, uh, RBF kernel, uh, well, it's not really feasible when you get over a week of, of uh, modeling time for, for, some, for some sizes. Whereas if you use um, a linear kernel, I mean, it, it, of course you have faster. And the, the, one of the question is, okay, is there a difference in, in the perf predictive performance? And for this property we can see, well, probably not. You, you, the recommendation would probably be to, to use a linear kernel in this, this sense. And, and, Really, having a nonlinear kernel, if you're above 100, 160,000 compounds, it takes a while. And this is run on, on, I think it's 64 cores on a supercomputer center, and it takes a week. So, I mean, it's substantial resources that we use on this. Uh, we tested the run to build on solubility data sets as well, and this, this is smaller, I think it's 40,000 or something. Yeah, 40,000. And it's, you, you can do that within a day or, or so. So, I mean, it's sort of, but this is a work in progress, and we're trying to evaluate how we can best uh, make use of, of high performance resources for this. And, but if you look under the hood for, for running, I mean, we run them in triplicates, we do a grid search to tune parameters, we do a cross validation to assess. I mean, it's a lot of different tasks that you break down. This is just a sub part of it. But, but it's sort of all of these yellow dots are jobs that we run, ind independent jobs we run and schedule on a supercomputer center. And you don't do this manually. You really don't want to do that. Keeping track of this, and actually the fault tolerance is what if that one breaks? How can you keep track of that? How can you rerun it? Okay, uh, going after you've uh, built your model, you also want to publish it. And publishing models uh, is uh, something that we, of course, been working on. You can see how I'm doing on time. Uh, for, for quite some time. Um, and we uh, uh, want, to, because we want an easy way for users to, to just use them. We want them to be available. We use the P2 provisioning system and we then inject them in BioClips so that we, once we've built the models, they should automatically down, be available. If you're using the BioClips client, you should say, you have new mod would you like to download the latest version of this model? Yes, <laughs> done, it's there. Yeah, I'm skipping this. So what we, we're aiming for, and I think we're getting very close, is to have a, a central system where we can actually query data sources and see is there new data available? Is there a new version of Campbell released, for example? Or does OpenFacts have new data? We can automate the training on our high performance systems, publish the data, archive the old models. Of course, you want to use them sometimes, they are one. And uh, the user, it would be transparent for the user. This is where we're aiming at. And I think we're getting pretty close. We have, we have a system that we can work for, at least for, for partly resources. But we want to ask a question, okay, could cloud have a lot of problems with, with running on HPC systems? First of all, not everybody has a high performance computer cluster. And second of all, it, it does, uh, has some implications uh, and, and for us. We have done some work on, on looking how we can uh, do modeling on Amazon Elastic Cloud. This is an attempt to try to, to quantify the costs for predicting a model on, on, on a cloud compared to a high performance computing center and, and comparing it to sort of buying your own server and putting it in the cellar and sort of. Uh, and uh, more work on cloud computing we're doing. We're participating in the Phenomenal Horizon 2020 project. This is for Metabolomics. It's more of a building a, a microservices architecture. We're working together with Google uh, to, to build this uh, project. It's led by EBI. Uh, and of course our aim in the end is to do predictions on the, uh, based on this. But then there are these big data frameworks. Can they improve and simplify modeling? We have this MapReduce, Hadoop, Spark, HDFS, and they, they receive a lot of attention. But, but are they useful for us in pharmaceutical bioinformatics? Um, well, I'm, they are quite, quite fundamentally different from, from, uh, from how we traditionally work with data. Is that you, you split your data in parts and you process them independently and then you can have a, a gathering function to, produce, to sort of summarize the results. And th this is not really what, what we traditionally use when we analyze data. 
So we, we looked at it for sequence analysis uh, and we, tried a, we, we spent a lot of effort on trying to build identical pipelines on Hadoop, as identical as possible on Hadoop and on the traditional high performance cluster comparing them and really showing the bottleneck with, with current high performance computing when data sizes increase. So this is in sequencing. Um, but what we're really moving into now is, is to using Spark because it's uh, sort of considered next generation Hadoop. Uh, it, it adds a lot of the caching and, uh, and when you work with data sets in Spark, uh, they are distributed, but you don't see it. So you, and if you participated in the tutorial by Marco Cappuccino and me uh, yesterday, you got to try this. It has an extensive library for machine learning and it really excels when you have iterative tasks like, like uh, logistic regression and machine learning in that sense. So one of the projects we're doing right now is to, to demonstrate and, and evaluate how Spark can be used for virtual screening. Um, the, the preliminary results say that we have, we, we achieve good scalability, but there's the lack of documentation when using these uh, new uh, technologies is, is really a, a bottleneck. I mean, it takes a lot of time to really understand how to use them. It's not the plug and play technology so far. And this you also got a flavor of when doing the tutorial. Setting up and running these systems are not trivial. And one interesting project uh, that you also got to try, and uh, I'm advertising poster P33. Marco is here in the audience as well. Uh, this was a project where, where, uh, where uh, we implemented inductive conformal prediction in Spark as, by extending the ML lib and uh, showing that we, we get valid predictions and good scalability on two large uh, data sets. We took the large data sets we could find, 11 million examples and 5 million examples. This is from from physics, as, as you see, and, and we're now applying this to, to PubChem data sets and trying to sort of model the large data, largest data sets that we can find and see. So some conclusions from our projects and from this talk. Uh, automation and continuous modeling is not trivial. It's a lot of components needed. The data management, the modeling, the model management, uh, they need to be resolved. Conformal prediction can, can provide us with, with the confidence measures. Um, we, we conclude that we need computational power to tackle larger problems. Uh, if it's cloud computing versus high performance computing, I think it depends on the application and what you have available. And you should use the tool that is best suited for your problem. And the same goes for workflows versus big data. Uh, it's not, they, they, we, we still haven't come to a conclusion when you should use workflows, when you should use uh, big data, and when you should sort of code your own uh, hack. Uh, it depends on the application as well, but we're, we're, we're learning a lot, and, and first uh, we need to evaluate this further. Um, some of our ongoing projects is that we, we were now augmenting the par parallel virtual screening with machine learning, combining uh, machine learning and sort of trying to predict should we dock the next substance or not uh, based on what we've learned so far. Um, we're also of course further developing the conformal prediction in distributed, in set, distributed settings. Um, we're, we're embarking on large-scale target predictions uh, where, where we uh, will use these technologies to, to, to uh, um, well, do large-scale target predictions. Um, and we, as I said, we're continuing to evaluate Spark, workflows, cloud, and high-performance computing. We, we, we still haven't reached the, 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 a really good agile system, but we are getting closer, and I think that it, this makes us more productive, but it's been a, a much longer road than we expected. And um, finally, I'd like to say that uh, we're very open for collaborations. Uh, we have, this is, this, it's a very nice gathering of people here today. So. If you're interested in anything like this, then, then please come and see me after this. And with that, thanks a lot. Thank you, Luna. So